Madam. Mujun Denue Magana Duk, Ganamushum Wab Makwan, Dijna Kaz Makwan Do Dem, Kuchiching and Don Jay. For those of you that, uh, that don't speak uh, Anishinaabemowin, the Ojibwe language here, uh, I will translate for you. Uh, what I've said in my language is uh, this is a stick up past your wallets to the front. <laughs> It's, um, what I said in my language was uh, basically acknowledging where I'm from. And uh, I do that to uh, uh, greet uh, those that protect and carry the stories of, of Treaty 6. And, and I do it in, not in a, in a token way. Um, I use a language to introduce myself about where I'm from, to acknowledge our histories as indigenous peoples, to acknowledge our territories, the laws, the histories in these territories and our agreements that go back long before cities were a thing. I come from Treaty 3 territory in northwestern Ontario. It's a small little pocket of heaven that uh, nobody knows very much about. There's not a lot of academic study that's been done in my territory. There's not a lot that people can tell you about the territory, but the people that are from there know a lot about it. Treaty 3 is Treaty 3 because our matriarchs, our women, would not sign treaty when they first showed up. They kept sending people away and our women would meet and there are many stories about why our women said no to treaty at first. It was because it was discussed about what we would be losing through treaty, what we would lose in the creation of these metropolises that we see today. Because make no mistake, we've lost a lot. We sit here and we look outside and we enjoy sushi. I like sushi. <laughs> dim sum, I like dim sum. Mostly just the foods that the Chinese brought. Anyway, um, <coughs> Chubby Ojibwe had to bring it to dim sum, huh? But we enjoy this space. We enjoy these places. But at the signing of treaty, it was told what we would lose. It, would, it was told what the arrangement, what the trade-off was going to be. And that's why when you look at the treaties, the numbered treaties, Treaty 1, is to the west of where I'm from, Treaty 2, to the west again, and finally Treaty 3. Finally, we signed the treaty. I'm the son of moose hunters. My mom is a moose hunter. My dad is a moose hunter. My mom was raised on a trap line. My grandmother raised on a trap line. I come from a long line of moose hunters. I don't know much about cities, so I can't really speak to what an Aboriginal city looks like. In fact, I wish you non-Native people were up here telling me what an Aboriginal city looks like, because I have no idea. We've been telling you for a long time that we're here, and you hold the power. You make the decisions. You run the meetings. So I kind of wish that this esteemed panel were some of you telling us what an Aboriginal city looks like, because I'd love to hear from you. So often, we are burdened with the responsibility time and time and time again to talk, to explain, to teach. I can't wait for the time when I get to sit and listen, to learn, to understand what you see so that when it is time to share the table and order off the menu, we know what's on the menu. And make no mistake, that time is coming. I'm not up here to bow down. I'm not up here to give power. But I'm up here to say that this is on you. This is on Canada. This has to come from your dinner tables. This has to come from your Thanksgiving dinners. This has to come from your institutions. The answers are with our people and our communities, but we've been talking for a couple hundred years. So I'd love for that conversation to change. I'd love for 
the opportunity to sit and listen to you tell me what an Aboriginal city is. I know what I can't do in the city. I can't hang my dead moose from my oak tree. <laughs> Apparently it brings down property values. <laughs> I know that. I know that once in a while a coyote or a wolf will come into the outskirts and I know they send those poor news reporters from CBC and Global out there to go catch some footage of it. I don't know why you guys do that. Those animals are dangerous. <laughs> so I know what I can't do here. I know what I can do though. I can contribute to the conversation. I can show up time and time again. I can be a good brother. I can be a good partner. I can listen and I can share and I can be patient. Man, are we patient. <laughs> to a fault, we are patient. But I offer this. Cities are the places where our languages are being revitalized. Cities are the places where we send our young people to be educated. Cities are the places where we often come in with, come into contact with our cultures and our ceremonies for the very first time. I went to my first sweat lodge my very first sweat in downtown Toronto. <laughs> I wish that were a joke. <laughs> at Anishinaabe Health, I climbed into a sweat lodge for the very first time at the age of 21, and my life was forever changed. For four rounds of that sweat, I cried. I made excuses about why I didn't want to be in there. I tried to crawl out the bottom of the sweat. And at the end of it, the elder made me aware that there was a mouse spirit <laughs> gnawing at the side of the sweat, or there was somebody desperately trying to climb out. <laughs> I crawled out of that sweat lodge changed forever. I crawled out of my hands and knees humbled with a lot of questions on my mind. And I looked up to the CN Tower. <laughs> <laughs> the world's largest eagle staff. <laughs> and I prayed. It was two days after that sweat I went to my first real Indian protest. I'd never been to one before. I wasn't raised with language, culture, or ceremony. I'm, I'm an intergenerational survivor of residential schools. My family wasn't blessed with powwow life. We weren't blessed with ceremony. And at that very first Indian protest, I got a taste of what it meant to stand for something. It was at Queen's Park. We were protesting a policy Bob Ray was trying to pass. I don't know what we were mad about, but oh man, we were, we were really pissed off, boy, you know. Because that's how it is sometimes. We, we, when the phone rings and it's your cousin and he says, bro, come on down here, we're protesting here. Like, well, what about, he's like, I don't know, but they're throwing a barbecue after, come on. And so we all show up. But it was in a city where I met some of the most influential people in my life. People that took the time to bring me out onto the land. People that showed me where the medicines were, what the medicines were, and how they would help me in my life. And what I didn't realize that while I wasn't raised with language, culture, and ceremony, I was raised on the land. I was raised with an intimate connection to where I'm from. I was raised to know that if we had moose meat in the freezer, we were very lucky. If we had fish, it was going to be a good day. And that connection will never be lost. And I say that that connection, whether we're in a city or whether we're out in our traditional territories, that that land is the same. Our ancestors are here. We're buried here. We bled here. We starved here. We celebrated here. We feasted here. We welcomed all of you here. 
and we'll continue to do so, hopefully in a better way moving forward. Miigwech.